There we go. Okay. All right, we're back, and we're going to be starting now Revelation chapter 8. And before we do that, I want to do a quick review of the first seven chapters, because it's been a few weeks. And I want you to notice some patterns that are being developed in the book here. Um, the number seven, you'll notice, comes up an awful lot in this book. Mm. They're happening in sevens, and there's, there's several key sevens that the the three cents that the book is re revolving around are these three sevens in the middle of the book, the three, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls that we're going to come up to. So we had the prologue, the introduction, John's vision of Christ, and then it immediately begins with his letters, his the Lord's words of the Lord Jesus to the seven churches. So we had the church in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira. And if you notice on the notes I sent you the, the map, um, did you see the, uh, that the, those seven churches are all um, in Asia Minor? And if you follow it, you can see the order that these things are written are the way that the letter would have been delivered to them. It would have, the Patmos, the closest church to Patmos was Ephesus. <laughs> That's the first, <clears throat> and then um, it goes up just north to Smyrna, and then further north to Pergamum, and then it comes down south again to Thyatira, and then uh, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Uh, so you had those seven churches in chapters two and three, addressing the concerns, the challenges that they're facing. In chapter four and five, now we have another vision. So this seems to be the pattern: you get sevens, and then you get sort of a series of visions. And then you get another seven and you get another series of visions and so forth. So we have this vision of the throne in heaven and uh, the Lamb of God being introduced, uh, who is worthy to open the seals. And if you remember what that scroll was about, what's the whole, what's this scroll with seven seals about? Anyone remember what that was? That was the scroll from uh, Daniel, correct? There is a scroll. It's similar to the scroll given to Daniel where he says, seal it up, right? And he says to Daniel, seal up these things. And now, so the, uh, the unsealing of the scroll, what does that mean? When the lamb, when Jesus appears and starts breaking the seals, what does that mean? It means he's the only one that can do it. Yeah, <clears throat> he's All the only one who can do it. But what is he doing when he's breaking the seals? Anyone remember what kind of a document this was? The scroll, it like a, 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 almost like a will, or it is. It's like a will, a contract. It's, it is. It's it's written on both sides, and it was basically the breaking of the seals is now the reading of the will and the initiation of it. It's bringing about all the things that are written that were promised for this last day, for this day of judgment. Now are being unlocked and opened up. And they're coming to pass. So when he breaks the seal, we saw, for example, the first, he starts breaking the seals in chapter six. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing that happens when he breaks the seal? Those first four seals he breaks. You can see it here. He's a white horse. Yeah. He starts sending out the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse mm -hmm. are sent out. And so the first one, uh, the white horseman, a white horse who uh, is bent on conquest. And um, he starts, if you remember those, those four horsemen were taken from Zechariah, they were the patrolling horsemen who were coming back with the report that everything was peaceful in the world. And Zechariah is uh, distressed by this because um, God's people are suffering, they're oppressed, mm -hmm. they're in exile. And all the world is at peace. And so when, when Christ un, unfolds the seals now, these horsemen, these patrolling horsemen are, are kind of coming and causing great disruption uh, on the earth. There's no longer peace. Now they begin to seek con to conquer one another. And then the red horse comes and takes peace from the peace earth. From the there's a lot of bloodshed and war. And then the, what's the third one? The, the, the black. black horse, right? Yes. And bringing yeah. famine. 
and because of the wars that have been started. And then the pale horse, which means death, death and famine and pestilence. And so we start, but these are not, this is not the wrath of God. These are just the first seven seals kind of preparing the way because it's that fifth seal that we saw in uh, chapter seven now, I think it is. No, the fifth seal is still in chapter six. The fifth seal, and that's the important, what's happening in the fifth seal? There's a question being asked of the Lord. You can see that in verse 10. Let's just read that. Um, Claudette, would you start that for us? Just open uh, verse 9 to 11, that fifth seal. And I want to stress this one for us. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Yeah, that, that question there of how long until you judge an event. So those first four horsemen, they were not bringing God's judgment upon the world. They're just stirring up trouble. They're stirring the pot. That's really all they're doing. This is all preparation. This is not the wrath of God. The souls under the altar now, those who have been shed, who have been sacrificed for Christ's sake, are crying out for vengeance now. How long will you avenge our blood? And then we have the sixth seal. And when the sixth seal is is opened, what do we have? Um, it, it, it's Again, it's this, there's a great earthquake. earthquake. The sun is blotted out for time. Everyone goes into hiding. And again, it's this, it's still this preparation. You can feel the tension rising. It's not the wrath of God yet. It's just preparing for it. Because then we get to the seventh, chapter seven. <clears throat> we have a little interlude now before that seventh seal is broken. Um, what has to happen before he opens that seventh and last seal, which will unleash now, begin to unleash wrath what has to happen he has to put a seal on the on the people that are saved yeah yeah <laughs> that hundred and forty four thousand. if you remember we talked about that right um what do they represent they re represent us really body yeah. of christ yeah that's the body of christ that he, he presents it in two different ways if you remember that imagery where he he hears something he hears a number of 144,000, and it's this, it's this very strange um, census being given for 12,000 from these 12 tribes, but they're really not the 12 tribes because one of them's missing, and then Joseph is mentioned, and he's not a tribe, and Levi is brought in, and he's never really mentioned no. as one of the tribes. But, but this is a special tribe, uh, symbolic <clears throat> of the faithful of Israel. Dan is removed because they're the unfaithful tribe. Levi are the priests, and Joseph <laughs> takes the place of Ephraim, who's also kind of an unfaithful one. But Joseph is the perfect one to represent the church. He's the suffering one. Um, but anyway, but what does it mean? Well, when he looks, after he hears the number, he then looks... And what does he see, what it means? Well, he sees. So many people, they can't count them all. Yeah. And from mm. every nation. Every nation. Tribe, right? Mm. And so that's the meaning of this 144,000. It's when he looks and sees, it's a great multitude from every nation. This is the true Israel, the true people of God from every nation. That includes us. And uh, crying out before the Lord, you know, and, and praising him for his salvation and these are the ones who have been brought through the tribulation and that's all of us we're, in this world we have trouble and we're brought through that mm -hmm. so we but that's really important to get that as we are now going into chapter eight and we're going to hear the trumpets now we need to understand that those who have been sealed are not going to this is not for them 
This is an answer to the prayer of those martyrs. How long before you avenge our blood? So we saw God do this before. Do you remember in the Exodus, in the plagues? Do you remember there was a certain point at which God distinguished Israel from Egypt? If you when he had that. them put the blood on the uh, on the man on the, the, the doorpost door, or on the yep. doors, yeah, the blood on the doorpost, so they didn't experience the, the angel of death. And even before that, there were certain points where some of the plagues, it says, it didn't affect Israel, the Israelites. They were they didn't have to deal with some of these plagues. Um, so now we're going to take a look at chapter eight, and. Uh, we finally so can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So in um, in that time in, that we looked at in uh, chapter seven, in, there was that reprieve, that kind of that pause. Were there? So it's, it's assuming that there are more people that were martyred during that time, right? Because in chapter in chapter the chapter before it talks about um, people, still more people to come that were killed. Yeah. So I, I would say here's an important point is. Revelation is not a narrative. It's not something that happens to, to, to details events chronologically. So you don't have to, the, the point of it is not that the, the timing of things, because if you start reading it that way, it just makes no sense when you have stars falling and then people are still alive and that you have all these catastrophes happening and people are still around to talk about it and to rebel. So it's, it's not, there's not this chronological, it's, it, it kind of, the point, the point of it is that um, that point in chapter six is you wait that, the, that he's not answering just yet because there are more who need to be slain. There are a select number that God has ordained that are to be martyred. And so there's a, there's a work that has to be complete. The, the testimony has to be complete before he unfolds his wrath. <clears throat> when we get now, to, then we have this preparation. So it's, it's just kind of stating a fact of, we could, we could say it, it applies for us today. Uh, it applied for them at that time in a certain way because there are moments of judgment that he brings about so we might say in Jerusalem, there were many saints who were slain in Jerusalem in the first century. And God could say to them, uh, I am not going to destroy Jerusalem, which he did in 70 AD, until my work there is complete. And so he does that. I think that principle applies to us today. We could say that he's not going to bring final judgment until his work is complete, until those who have uh, given their lives for Christ and and the witness of Christ is complete, and then he comes. So it applies on a grand scale, but it also applies on the narrow scale when he brings judgment upon particular nations and particular cities. If that makes yeah. some sense here. So, um, yeah, so it, it, is, it is tricky because it's kind of written like, like it's describing events that happen one another, but it's not. These are visions that are happening after one another, and the visions don't necessarily describe chronological events they're describing um god's ways of unfolding his judgments and, uh, and 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 certain principles that we'll discover in them as he goes so it's not as if god hasn't already sealed his people that he has to stop the action and then seal everybody okay now we can continue no it the point is it's stressing to us that we are not going to endure this wrath. He sealed us from before time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, no, there's no chronological order to that. Uh, just the point is that he won't unfold his judgments um, upon his people. So I think we saw that in Ezekiel too. Didn't we see that where it was God took out his people? He, he, he brought them into Babylon specifically to preserve his faithful remnant. And that those who remained in Jerusalem were destroyed. All right, so now we come to the seventh seal. Let's take a look at that. And um, let's see, uh, Bob Thomas, would you read verses one to five? Is that big enough for you? Yep, yep, that's fine. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, 
there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer uh, with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay, great. All right. So first thing you want to notice is when John has this, this vision here, where, where is the th these, these visions happening? So you'll, you're going to see in, in the book of Revelation, you'll see... John is having visions of things happening in heaven, and then he'll have, he'll have visions of things happening on earth. And he'll kind of go back and forth between the two. So it's really important to get a sense of, okay, where is his, this vision taking place? What is he, where is, what is he's he? In, he's in heaven. He's seen he in heaven. Yeah, he, his vision is of things happening in heaven uh, before the very throne of God. And, and what, the first thing he sees in verse 8 uh, is what? What's the first thing he, he says here? Great mountain. Uh, before that. Uh, the seven angels. Before the angels. The very first thing. in verse The lamb opening the seal. So the lamb opens uh -huh. that last seventh seal. Uh -huh. And when he opens it, what happens? Silence. There's silence. There's silence in heaven, in heaven. for about half an hour. Now, why do you think that might be the case? Why would there be suddenly silence for half an hour? Anticipation of what's about to happen? Yeah, yeah, it really is. So if you take a look at a few uh, scriptures here, for example, in uh, Psalm 62, um, we see this phrase here, uh, verses 1 and 2. Um, Elizabeth, would you read that for us? God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. And keep, keep going down for the yep. interview. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to trust him, to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but in, inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Okay, Those are... Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. So, you notice in 62 here, that phrase... My soul waits in silence. And that's going to be a refrain you're going to hear in some of the other prophets as well. Yeah. My soul waits in silence. And what is it his soul waiting for in silence? According to the context of Psalm 62, what does he say is, is going on in verses 3 and 4? Sounds like judgment. Yeah. Yeah, he's under attack. He says, how long will you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall? Uh, he's speaking to his enemies. And they bless mm -hmm. their mouths, but inly they curse. And then he's calling out to God and waiting on God in silence for him to rescue him, to bring him salvation, but also to bring destruction upon his enemies. And so there's this waiting in silence. So we got to keep that in mind when with this, this waiting in silence we see in Revelation 8 is this anticipation of God to do what only God does, which mm -hmm. is to judge, to avenge, um, to bring salvation to his people and to judge and to destroy his enemies. I, I have a quick question, Mike. Yeah. Michael, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm looking at uh, Roman uh, Revelation 8.1, when the lamb opened the seventh seal, 
Yeah. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now mm -hmm. we know that in heaven, there is no time. I was yeah. just wondering where that half an hour vision came from. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's, from John, that's John's perspective. So John oh, okay. is having this in time vision of uh -huh. things. And so just imagine how long that is. Sure. It, it just, it's, just to, it's to true. see, we just, we had all these seals being opened, right? He's uh -huh. having these visions of all these seals and all this action happening. And sure. then suddenly that seven seal opens and stops. Everything. And just silence. And he says it's about half an hour for him. Mm, okay. A long time. Even waiting like a minute in silence seems like a long time. Sure. But for half an hour now waiting, waiting, anticipating what's going to happen. What is going to happen next? Okay. And it unfolds. Now it's like, it's almost like I, I did this. If you were a teacher, um, and you had these rambunctious kids who are not paying attention. And a classic teacher position is to stand in front of the class and say, I'm waiting, you know, <laughs> I'm waiting, you know, and so everyone, until everyone is completely silenced and you have their full attention, then you begin. <coughs> so there's a sense of this waiting. Okay. Now we'll have your full attention. Um, now it holds um, the wrath of God and his answering he begins to answer um the prayers of the saints when we look mm -hmm. their blood so let's take a look at that and we have now these trumpets mm -hmm. um trumpets you can look up the verses when are trumpets used in the scriptures okay. what's the purpose of a trumpet to proclaim something yeah yeah. It, it, it's pronouncing, it's proclaiming, you, you blow the trumpet before the king enters, you blow the trumpet in battle, you know, when every time you need to make this announcement and you need everyone's full attention, mm. we have now the trumpets being blown. Yeah. And, uh, seven angels with seven trumpets, yeah. again, we have that seven theme. Mm. And the first thing uh, we're giving to them, before the trumpets are blown, um, the first three we have another angel um coming and what does he do so again that we're still in heaven what does this angel do verse three let's read that one more time uh raymond would you read that for us verses three the only uh, problem is i have you people on the side and i can't see across okay the... all right no worries no worries we'll get somebody else to read that um let's see uh bob follow would you get that for us three to five Three to five? Okay. Yeah. And another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Okay. Now, that whole scene there, an angel came, stood at the altar with a golden censer, and was given incense to offer before the throne, mm -hmm. uh, the golden altar before the throne. What is that? That's an image that we've seen this before. What, what is going on here? What is, what is that sort of a picture of? Temple. Yeah, that's the, the picture of the temple, but this isn't the temple. This is the real temple. This is the mm. real throne of God. And we have an angel here standing with an altar with a golden censer and offering incense. Who does that? Who, who in the temple stands at the altar with golden censer and offering incense? Priest, high priest, the high priest. Yeah, these are your priests doing this. Mm. Um, and particularly the high priest of the Day of Atonement. So we have this, that, if you remember that, that was the temple sacrifice system here. We yeah. had twice a day, the priest would go offer his sacrifice and then he would come into the temple with the blood and the incense and burn the incense before the altar um, interceding for the people. So we have a mention of this offering the incense right but 
mm. along with the incense, the priest is supposed to offer a sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice? Jesus. We have Jesus. Yeah. But in the book of Revelation, there was another mention of a sacrifice under the altar. Was that the people who were martyred? Yeah. We have the, the remember the martyrs? The souls of the martyrs are mm -hmm. under the altar with their blood having been spilt. That's the same altar here that the angel is offering this incense. Mm -hmm. And that incense is going up with, with, with what? It's mixed with what? Get Smoke it? and prayer. The, the, the prayers prayer. of the saints. Prayers of the saints. So this is a continuation of that scene of the souls under the altar praying to God, how long until you avenge our blood, O God. Mm. And that angel now taking, burning the incense before the throne of God himself with the prayers, bringing them before the Lord, the Father, to, uh, to answer that prayer. So... It's a really, it's a fascinating scene. And the question is, is, is this just an angel or could it possibly be the Lord himself, who's our great high priest, perhaps, you know? Um, but the scene is really, an, it's an amazing scene of the, of the blood and the incense um, and the prayers of the saints coming up. So what is happening here now is that these trumpets are the answering now of that prayer that this is now a direct answer to the prayer how long until you avenge our blood in fact what happens next the angel takes the censer fills it with fire from the altar and throws it on the earth and there is thunder and rumbling flash of lightning and an earthquake so this is this is john's way of this vision implies that the what is happening now, this, this fire is always a representation typically of what? Fire. Fire being thrown in the earth. His wrath? Yeah. Yeah. That's God's wrath. And so it's now uh, he's taking that censer, the, the asking for vengeance, filling it with fire, throwing it in the earth. And now we have these rumblings, these thunders, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake, which we've also seen this before, too. Um, where have we seen flashes of lightning, rumblings, earthquakes, fire in the Old Testament? We've seen this quite a few times, actually. Mm. Uh, we'll take a look at a couple passages here. Exodus... Uh, 9, 22 to 26. Um, Nancy, would you read that for us? Yes. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that there may be half in all the land, hail in all the land on man and beast and every plant in the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire, ran down the earth. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as have never been seen in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Yeah. You know, the Exodus is a, is a powerful story that reflects this in, in Revelation. You have in the Exodus a people of God, of Israel, suffering, yes. oppressed by Pharaoh, crying out, how long, O Lord? How long? It's been hundreds mm -hmm. of years. And then when judgment comes, you see this now, hail and fire and thunder and flashings and 
and destruction coming upon Egypt. But you'll notice what it said at the end. Um, that Israel was spared. Israel was spared from that. And that kind of carries with that theme that they've been sealed. That people have been sealed. Um, this, this is now a direct from heaven to earth. Uh, God's judgment upon the, his enemies of his people. So let's take a look um, at these seven trumpets now. And uh, uh, Michael, can yeah. I just interject something here? Sure. Uh, wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed the sense in a similar way? Yep, absolutely. F fire and brimstone? Yes. Heaven. Yeah, so you're going to see that, <laughs> you know, God... God's judgments uh, upon <clears throat> the world, you're going to see him judging in different ways. And, and um, that, that way that he did with Pharaoh coming from above and same with Sodom and Gomorrah, two classic scenes of final judgment where it comes with fire from above. Um, it's, yeah, it's very telling. All right, let's take a look at our seven trumpets here. And uh, let's read those here. Carol, would you mind reading? Uh, I, I want to go through all the, I want you to try an exercise with you here. So we're going to read, the, read them all as a bunch. You'll, you'll notice when he goes through the sevens, he does it first as a, a four. And then there's usually a four, two, and a one. So you have the four together. And then usually there's a, a split that happens. And then you get to the next two. And then you have another thing. And then to the last one. That's what we saw with the seals. We had the four seals, the four horsemen. And then you had sort of two more, and then you had an interlude, and then you had the final one. So here we have the first four trumpets being blown. And let's, I want you to, to just listen carefully to them and see if you notice some themes that are common between these four before we break them down individually. So uh, Carol, would you read that for us? Six, 13. Um, I'm sorry. I have to I'll unmute you there for a second. Can you unmute yourself there, Carol? There you go. I start with verse six. Yeah, verse six, down to 13. Okay. <laughs> now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creature in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. <laughs> the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so, do the, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining. And likewise, a third of the, right, of the night. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Whoa, whoa, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other turn trumpet three angels are about to blow. <clears throat> okay. All right. Observations on this text here. What do you notice some things in these first four trumpets that uh, uh, seem to okay. have in common? Taking the revenge. They, they are. Um, yeah. What, what's, what are some of the first things you, you notice here? Fire. Everything's in thirds. Everything is, it's, we'll start with that. Everything's coming in thirds. You, you notice that a third of the trees mm -hmm. was burned up. Um, where else do we have it here? 
Third of uh, the living creatures. Third of the living creatures. And eight. Ships. Third, third of the waters. <clears throat> Fire. Ships. A third of the waters became wormwood. Um, what else do we have? Any a third of the here? day. Yeah. Sun, the moon, yeah, and sun stars. Was struck, sun. Of the moon, right? And mm -hmm. so a third of the day might be shining, likewise a third of the night. All right, let's talk about that. What's the, what do you think that's about? About the third? Thing is, a lot, there's a lot that's going to happen. There'll be more left than there, but it's not like specifically splitting it up into thirds. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, the, the third is not, uh, again, we're not thinking literally here with these things, but the, the significance of the third is that it's, it's not the majority, it's a minority of it, but it's significant. And so it's a partial judgment. It's the first parts of it where we see things happening in thirds. It's almost, um, why might God do this? Why, for example, does God, when he wants to rescue Israel from Pharaoh, why does he do it in 10 plagues? Why not just do it in one? You know, I mean, Isn't just, each, each one's trying to give them an opportunity to turn back. Yeah, you're absolutely right with that. There is this patience with God, even in the midst of his final judgment. <clears throat> you're going to see that. I think in the next chapter, you'll see a phrase that comes up uh, where that even after uh, these judgments happen, they did not repent of their murders. They did not repent of their idolatries. He'll, he'll use that phrase quite a bit in the next chapter mm -hmm. where things are happening and there's a sense of like, there seems to be still time to repent. And with Pharaoh, when God unfolds his judgment, you never get a sense that he was too hasty in it, that he didn't give him enough time or enough chances. It's very clear when the judgments happen, they had time, even think about, Think about the other judgment scenes. What are the famous judgment stories in the Bible? What's the very first judgment story in the Bible? Adam and Eve. Oh, that's good. They, they do get kicked out. But I mean, I mean, talking about final judgment where God just destroys people. No, no, no and the the Noah and the and the ark. Yeah, Noah and the ark, right? And and about that, <clears throat> um, how how much time did God give the people before He brought the flood? Was that like a hundred years? years? hundred yeah. years. It was like a hundred mm. years he gave them. And all the while, Noah is building an ark in the mm. middle of it. Uh, and if there were any who would come into that ark, they could have been saved. And the point is, did God give them enough time to repent? Plenty. Oh, my goodness, yes. How about, yes. how about the next judgment scene? What's the next great judgment you see in the Bible after Noah? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Was God patient with them? Yes. Yes. That's the whole point of Abraham's intercession. Look how patient God is. He would have spared that city if there were 10 people. Just mm -hmm. 10. And then when, when Lot goes in there, he still spares Lot and his daughters. And he would have spared more, except they refused to believe. Mm -hmm. And he, even Lot's own wife refused to believe. And so you have this, this patience of God. And then you see it with the same thing with, uh, um, with Pharaoh. You see it later on with Israel when they're taken over by the Assyrians. You know, it was in the time of Ahab that God declared that Israel was done and would be judged. Mm. That judgment still wouldn't happen for another, I think, 100 years or so. And the same thing with Judah. Uh, he declares judgment upon them during the time of Manasseh, but it would be several kings after that before Judah is judged. Uh, there is this patience with God. So even as these trumpets are blowing now, <laughs> He could have done it in one trumpet and said, it's over. But he brings it in seven. And with each one, there is something's happening that is, seems to be giving, showing the patience of God as he's unfolding his final judgment. What's another thing that you notice in this passage, these four trumpets that they kind of have in common? <clears throat> There's some different themes. There's some um well there was blood with the fire in a couple of them all right so we have fire let's talk about fire we have fire mentioned in the first angel 
fire with a second burning with fire. Uh, we have a blazing like a torch in the third. I don't know if there's any fire in the fourth. Lights go out in the fourth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have fire and darkness. By the way, when Christ talks about hell, he uses two primary images. If you remember what they were? Fire. Pit of yeah. fire. Lake of fire, right? Lake of fire. Of the lake of fire prepared Dark, for his angels. Darkness. And the outer darkness. Cast in the outer darkness with his weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? And so here you have, again, themes of judgment. The fire and the darkness. Uh, let's look at the first. Another, another thing you'll notice here is, is the, what is the focus of the judgment? What's being attacked, so to speak? What's being destroyed? The earth. Well, the first is the. All, all, yeah. All yeah. four of those um, involve something uh, being thrown or falling on the earth, different parts of the earth, and causing the destruction. Yeah. You'll, you'll notice it's not a direct attack on mankind. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. That the judgment yeah. is hitting first the, the trees and the grass. Then it hits the, the, the seas and the sea living creatures, the sea, sea creatures, and the ships. And then you have uh, the rivers. Um, and then you have the, uh, the moon, the stars, and the sun <clears throat> being attacked. And you'll see that he hasn't unfolded his direct wrath against mankind, but these are indirect in that people are clearly affected by them. And we'll it's also it, he's also killing, destroying things that are living, like trees and grass. And then yep. the next one is the living creatures in the sea. Yeah. And then he gets to man. Yes. And he mentions, yeah, it's interesting, the living, and I would say living and moving, because you have ships too. Mm -hmm. uh, these things that are uh, and you'll notice also that these are all sort of part of the creation story in Genesis 1 where God on the fourth day creates the trees and the grass and the, and, and the land comes forth. And then he fills the seas in day five with the living creatures. Uh, in day, uh, is it day four, he has the, uh, the stars and the sun and the moon. And of course you have the rivers in, in Eden and all this fresh water. So these are all the, all the wonders of his creation that, that make life possible are now being dismantled. Are now being, but not completely, just a third, just a third. Mm. Um, so let's take a look at each one of them here. Uh, the first trumpet blows. Uh, Nancy, would you read that for us again? Verse uh, seven. Yes. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Okay. All right. Hail and fire mixed with blood. Remind you of anything? Well, the uh, high priest uh, offering a sacrifice. Uh, yeah. Um, hang on a second. I got to turn off my notes. <laughs> hang on a second. Hold on a second. There we go. I lost you for a minute here. Okay, uh, yeah, we have the, the high priests up there offering the sacrifice and, the, and that angel throwing down, there was hail and fire and such. And the hail and fire, um, we saw those judgments back in, in the Exodus. Uh, that was the, I think the eighth plague, uh, which plague that was in the Exodus ninth. We read that one before, Exodus nine. There's another reference to it in Isaiah 30. Let's take a look at that real quick. And uh, Nancy, would you continue reading this one here? Yes. And the, and the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire with cloudburst and storm and stones. The Assyrians will be terror stricken at the voice of the Lord when he with his rod 
every stroke of the appointed staff that the Lord lays on them will be to the sound of tram tr tambourines and lyres, battling with brand shed arm, fight with them for a burning place as long been prepared indeed for the king it is made ready it is its pyre made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance the breath of the lord like a stream of sulfur kindles it wow so i don't know what that's a what's going on in that passage this is about the assyrians during the time of isaiah um the assyrians had come in and they in seven I think in 722, they had destroyed Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel and sent them out. And then they put Jerusalem under siege during the time of, of Hezekiah. And Isaiah pleads with them for the Lord and the people repent. And they, and God, if you remember how he destroyed the Assyrians, remember what he did? If you remember that story. But in one night, the Assyrians completely are, have, have Jerusalem surrounded and they're they're taunting the Jews, absolutely taunting them. What God will save you? No God can rescue you from our hands. And they pray to the Lord. And basically what happens in the middle of the night, the Lord sends his angel and kills something like 180,000 Assyrian soldiers so that they have to flee in humiliation. And then the Assyrians are soon conquered by the Babylonians and they're done for, never to be heard from again. And that's the end of their empire. And so you see, it wasn't a, he, he didn't actually do this with the Assyrians sending hailstones, but they became uh, a metaphor representative of God's judgment from on high, a direct judgment from God against them through hail and fire. And the whole, the picture of hailstones is great. I mean, just think about what it is. Um, God's stoning of his people. Remember, stoning in the Old Testament was a form of judgment and execution. And here God is stoning the earth, stoning mankind for their wickedness, having found them guilty. Um, so we have that scene here. The first angel blows his trumpet, and the direct result is um, the earth being burned up and the trees and the green grass, a third of them being taken out. Let's take a look at the next one here. Um, we leave off here. Let's start from, I want to make sure everyone has a chance to read here. Um, Claudette, would you start us again here in verse uh, eight and nine? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Great mountain burning with fire. I don't know if that reminds you of anything. Uh, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, yes. Yeah, it was, it was a great a mountain uh, blaze. Um, it describes like a volcano almost. Uh, in fact, I think it's around this time that Vesuvius had experienced had gone off you know, yeah around this time and so they were well acquainted with the imagery here there is some interesting images i didn't i didn't quite realize but in jeremiah 51 we have uh, this image imagery given of babylon and uh which is really interesting 24 and 25 um uh Claudette, would you read that for us i'm sorry i was I was just I reading. Know. What? Where are we? Twenty-four, twenty-five. Twenty-four and twenty-five. Uh, Jeremiah fifty-one. I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil that they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burnt mountain. Yeah. So here he describes this great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea. And in Jeremiah 51, he describes Babylon mm -hmm. as this destroying mountain and really becoming a burnt mountain. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Um, I'm not even sure if they were mountains in Babylon or not, but the point is this great power uh, being thrown down. <clears throat> and there's another passage. Isn't there another story about um, a mountain being thrown into the sea? Does that, does that ring a bell? Well, uh, Jesus said if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could, you know, um, throw a mountain into the ocean. Yeah, it's really interesting. That passage here is really fascinating. It says, um, this is in Matthew 21. Um, and let's see, um, Bob Fowler, would you get that for us? 21, 18 to 22. Sure. <clears throat> in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves and said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again and the fig tree with it at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. This is a fascinating scene here. This is the one miracle of Jesus where he destroys something. Um, do you know the significance of that fig tree, why he curses it and what it really is about? It's uh, someone bearing no fruit, like like we're supposed to do his his will. You can say you believe in him, but if you bear no fruit, then you don't real you're not really believing in him. Yeah, yeah. There's this fruit. He's expecting fruit, and there's none, and so you're under judgment because you didn't bring forth fruit. Now, there's an immediate application of this because this story. If you look at the full chapter here, do you see what happened right before then? And according to Matthew's he account, the here, temple. he cleanses the temple. So he goes into the temple, which is on a mountain, by the way. This is Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And on this mountain, he cleanses the temple and says, this is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves, right? Mm. He condemns the priests and the Jews in the temple because they are the ones who are supposed to be bringing forth fruit like a fig tree. And when he came to find it, there was none. And so he curses it and it withers and dies. The disciples asked Jesus, how did you do this? And he says, if you have faith, not only can you destroy a fig tree like this, but look what he says. You can say not to any mountain, to this mountain. Mm -hmm. What mountain is that? Mountain that, that the temple is on. Exactly right, is Mount Zion, the temple, Jerusalem. And you can throw it into the sea and it will happen. And frankly, that's exactly what did happen. So mm -hmm. to be thrown into the sea is a, is a symbol of, as we see in Revelation here, a mountain being thrown into the sea is a symbol of the destruction of a great power. The destruction of something great and glorious is being thrown into the sea, which is the place of judgment and chaos and, just, and death. And so when he is calling for here is basically is that this mountain is under judgment and it will be thrown into the sea as it was when the Romans came in in 70 AD and brought this vengeance upon them, which is about the time that John is writing this. So this great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea, uh, this can be uh, it's, it's symbolic of a couple things. It could be a symbol of Babylon, which is that great mountain in Jeremiah that would be burnt and which in, in John's time is Rome. It could be a symbol of Jerusalem. And, the, and Jer remember Jerusalem and Rome were the two powers responsible for the blood of the martyrs. Mm. They were the ones who were killing the Christians. It was the Jews and the Romans at the time. And so judgment is coming upon them. So whichever mountain he has in mind here in Revelation 8, um, we can see that this is uh, um, 
this, this imagery of what Jesus talks about, a mountain being thrown into the sea, and Jeremiah, a mountain, a great mountain becoming a burnt mountain. Um, let's come back to our passage here. Michael, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the Babylonians and the Chaldeans? Um, they're, they're used interchangeably, actually. Okay. Um, I, I don't know the there might be a subtle difference between them. Yeah, they're they're often used interchangeably, and uh, okay. that's a great question. I don't I don't I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the difference is, but they're they're often used interchangeably. So let's take a look here. So so he throws it now into the sea, and now we have even that which is living in the sea and the ships destroyed. Um, we're going to see troubles. And so some of these, some of these trumpets that are blowing at this time, these third things happening, um, were some of the things that are happening in that time. When the Romans came in, um, they did stuff like this, like burn up the trees and burn the land. And they did destroy the ships and uh, bring all kinds of trouble. So there, there could be literal applications of this. Uh, but symbolically, as we look at it, uh, we can see that... Uh, further scenes of judgments upon the great powers that are persecuting the church. These great mountains are the sources of the tribulation for God's people, whether it's Rome and Babylon, the city of seven hills there, or Jerusalem. Uh, these are the sources of their, of their trouble mm -hmm. and being thrown down. All right, let's, let's finish up here. Let's take a look at a couple more here. Um, Let's see. Um, Elizabeth, would you read for us uh, 10 and 11 one more time? The third, the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the, the earth. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the water because it had been bitter and been made bitter. Okay. 10 and 11, that's it. That was it. <clears throat> so um, now a great star fell from heaven. Mm. Um, so what, what is, that's the question is, what is that about here? How, how have stars been used in, in Revelation so far? They were the, chur uh, the churches? Not the churches. Um, no, the churches are the lampstands. Right. And the stars? Are the angels? Are the angels, right? So now it's like, so we're, you know, it, a great star falling from heaven, blazing like a torch. Uh, some have said, literally speaking, is that a meteorite? Eh, who knows? Um, but there is a passage that speaks about uh, sort of a great star falling, um, blazing like a torch um, in Isaiah. 14. We have this scene here, uh, which is another interesting one. It's Israel is speaking about the king of Babylon now and describes him in verses 12 and 13. Uh, let's see, down to 15. Let's take it down to there, 12 to 15. Um, let me leave off here. Uh, Carol, would you read that for us? Can you see that? Okay. Sure. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Okay. This is uh, it's often used as a um, uh, reference to the devil himself for his, as the star, the um, thrown down. It, and it, I think it certainly applies to him, it, but in direct context, it's 
referring to the king of Babylon at that time, who glorified himself and how he is cut down to the ground. And he is described as this star fallen from heaven. So you have in the second trumpet blows and you have this great mountain thrown into the sea. And the third angel blows the trumpet and you have a great star falling from heaven. And so you can see in a sense, there's this um, one thing is the, the great mountain uh, symbolizing the great powers on earth that are persecuting the church, that are causing their trouble, being thrown and judged into the water, to the sea. And then this next trumpet, we have this star, this great star fallen from heaven, blazing like a torch, uh, sort of the spiritual dimension as well of the great powers that are causing trouble uh, on God's people being thrown down, blazing like a torch, falling. Um, and that causes now, that star is called wormwood which what is wormwood it, he was in the screw tape letters he is the, the devil tape. yeah what is the word what does wormwood mean what is it you know what that 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 uh it's kind of in the text there but wormwood is uh is it a bitter uh it's very bitter <laughs> and poisonous oh. um I, i'm not sure it's an herb or something but uh you see that for example in uh other passages on wormwood are by Proverbs, but let's look at Lamentations actually. Typically it's, it, it's a, uh, an oil that supposed, was supposed to be to kill intestinal worms. Yeah. From yeah. a plant, yeah. but it's bitter. So it's a bitter, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. Mm -hmm. My soul continually remembers it and bowed down within me. Uh, I remind, I have hope. Um, and so there's this lamentation speaks about that warmth, the bitterness of this. Uh, and it causes, and many people die from the bitter water, which kind of reminds you of that scene in the desert when the water it was bitter. Remember the first time they encounter water there and it's bitter and they can't drink it and the people complain. And Moses has to throw the log into the water to make the bitter water drinkable, which is another fascinating scene of... Uh, how the gospel of the Christ and the gospel, you know, takes the bitterness for us here. But what did what did um, God what did Moses do with um, in in uh, Egypt when Pharaoh when the water was contaminated for the Egyptians was that what was that what was the contamination? Blood. That, that was blood. That was blood. Water. Okay. Blood. Yes, but it, again, it affecting the water they couldn't drink. Um, and so something that was supposed to bring them refreshment and joy and life now is becomes bitter and even brings them death. Um, God is turning things now. And there's this, again, this further judgment. But, but even as he's describing these judgment scenes and, and the effect it's going to have on mankind, they are serving as these great warnings to us. So, so it's, it's almost like, um, how should we put it? You know, when, when you're in, just imagine, uh, was it back in the, uh, what was the financial crisis back in the day with Enron? You remember those things? And these yeah. great uh -huh. banking, these great institutions, they have this phrase, they are too big to fail, right? And all these great institutions were falling. And it was very troubling for everyone to see these great institutions falling. And unfortunately, you know, th that, those great institutions are really important when you see them fall because they serve as a warning to everyone. You know, when, when, when a little mom and pop business goes out of business, no one cares, no one notices. But when a, when a major bank fails, everyone notices and there are lessons to be learned. And so when you see these great powers falling, a third of the ships, uh, the, the burning up, the, the great mountain falling into the sea, the great star falling from heaven, these are warnings to us. And as we taste the bitterness, the wormwood, as we, uh, we see, you know, our crops destroyed, as we see our ships and commerce destroyed, as we see in the next trumpet, the, uh, the sun and stars and moon even going dark, uh, partially dark, serving as warnings to us. <clears throat> Pay attention. Take this seriously. Remember there was silence in heaven? Remember that? 
Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Everyone's paying attention in heaven, but not on earth. Mm -hmm. You know, not on earth. Uh, they're not learning from these things. Everyone in heaven is paying attention and God's people are paying attention, but the world will continue on. It's not enough to prepare them. And so the, the eagle cries out at the end, woe to those who dwell on the earth now. Uh, these first four, that's just the start. That's just the warnings now. Um, the next three angels are about to blow. These trumpets, this is the real trouble now. Um, and, and we're going to see God's wrath being un unleashed in, in these next three. So, All right, so that's the trumpets in, in chapter 8. Any last mm -hmm. comments or questions about that before we break here? So... Well, when you said that's the trumpets, that's the first four. We still have the other three. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Just next make chapter, sure. Next well, chapter. Yeah, okay. so next chapter, we're going to see the next two trumpets. And then uh, they're going to have another interlude for us. Uh-huh. Where, where a lot of scenes and visions are going to happen. Uh, that's been his style here. So four. And then we have sort of two. And then we have these interludes. And we'll see how that that goes. Okay. All right.